Um, it's uh, quarter seven, so I think just a bit of light entertainment. Um, a few reflections uh, before supper um, on um, there's uh, the uh, um, uh, science and the media. Um, uh, I've called this. Um, um, I can't remember what the title is again. Yeah. <laughs> the title uh, keeping it a bit too, Science keeping it a bit too simple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, well, despite my uh, slight disagreement with Carl at the uh, end of his talk, um, I obviously um, um, give credit to um, his very clear exposition of the um, profound Ill, uh, influence of the oracles of science in, uh, in uh, promoting the ascendancy of the materialist view in the Western world, um, which is essentially predicated ultimately on the supposition that the scientific disciplines of cosmology and evolutionary biology and neuroscience have provided an adequate materialist explanation for the fundamental questions, such as the origins of the universe, the phenomena of life, the nature of the mind, and so on. And of course, were that correct, then um, that would obviously be very important. But as we also know, uh, one could take exactly the contrary view, <coughs> which is that the recent advances of science have, as it were, torn away its facade of knowing to reveal our deep, deep ignorance, our radical ignorance about um, the inscrutability of these phenomena. And so the cosmology of the Big Bang brings to our attention in the most forcible way how it could possibly be that uh, matter and its laws could emerge from nothing. And the uh, advances of molecular biology have brought to our attention in the most forcible way, as indeed our friends in the intelligence design movement point out the utter and inscrutable complexity of this simplest form of life, which defies any rational attempt to explain, to provide an explanation of its emergence. So I um, want to um, spend not too long <laughs> uh, within the context of this sort of these contradictory metaphysical interpretations of the recent findings of science. And I want to, uh, to explore why it is that the media should um, so uncritically and influentially endorse the materialist view. And why it is that, as it were, the, uh, the contrary and metaphysical interpretation which is, you know, which of these issues which are substantial uh, tend to be overlooked. <coughs> now, uh, this is um, in order to get us off to a good start. Uh, just to put you in the picture, I've been working for the Telegraph for 20 years, uh, writing both for the Sunday and the Daily Telegraph. It is a, um, it's a glamorous life. <laughs> As you can see from this slide, this is what we get up to uh, uh, down in the fashion department, looking at the latest fashions. Here is uh, the editor's conference. This is quite an old uh, uh, slide, but you might be able to discern Charles Moore there at the back, Boris Johnson, now Mayor of London. <laughs> Uh, and somewhere down here, I think there's a copy of the Daily Mail, which is obviously the major source of our <laughs> stories every day. <laughs> and, uh, and here is the very important person, the cub reporter, the cub science reporter, who I will return to a bit later on. But we can see her attentively at the press conference taking notes. Now, at one level, the question of why it is that the media, or the, or the popular perception of science is media so massively endorses this sort of materialist view of science, the materialist view as epitomized by the oracles is evident enough. And that lies in the extraordinary, unbelievable, quite staggering achievement of science in the last 60 years. It is so extraordinary that actually it's rather difficult to take in. And I'd say 
I hope you will, <laughs> excuse me, if I do just take you through it. I mean, just a few highlights of it. Um, because you know, one has to get this in our mind's eye. Oh dear, you probably can't see that. Um, it's probably too small a slide. Anyhow, this is what I call science triumphant, <coughs> 1945 to 2001, 30 definitive moments. And it just lists, you know, simply, you know, uh, away the major important, oh, some of the major important findings. And just to, uh, you know, just to put this in its context, um, we start with, first of all, the extraordinary achievements of the applied sciences, and that's particularly medicine and the, the, and electronics, and um, uh, uh, and starting with medicine, we have in 1955 the first polio vaccine, 1960 the oral contraceptive, 1967 the first heart transplant, um, 1979 the first test tube baby. Um, somewhere down here we have got the introduction of the invention of magnetic resonance imaging of the brain, and so on and so on. This is just a smallest fraction of. Uh, in, uh, of innovations and discoveries which completely transformed uh, the whole practice of medicine over a period of 30, 40 years. Uh, we could apply exactly the same with um, uh, electronics, which starts, uh, sorry, with the, um, uh, the invention of the transistor in 1947 with the power to amplify the smallest electric current. And that, of course, <coughs> produces both the, uh, extra, you know, the uh, makes possible the space program, which starts with Sov the Soviet launch of Sputnik in '67 and goes on to Voyagers 1 and 2, and of course this phenomenal uh, developments in information processing with the first complete personal computer down here and um, uh, the, uh, the Hubble telescope in 1999 and many others. Um, so there we are, you know, applied science, complete teaching. I don't, you know, in a sense, you know these things, but it, it helps to sort of get this in our mind's eye because the thing about the way in which science has changed our lives, which is, of course, is a, a bit of a truism in that way, is, of course, that it is completely eclipsed and completely trumped by a much even greater achievement, which is that... In the last 50 years, science for the first time allows us for the first time in the history of our species to um, comprehend the whole of the history of the universe from the moment it started till yesterday. <laughs> and, and, and so, and there we have, oops, again, sorry. Um, and so here we have, obviously, we have the theory of the Big Bang in 65, the theory of the formation of the chemical elements of the stars. We have uh, the, plate tech the discovery of the theory of plate tectonics and how the Earth evolved. Uh, we have the James Lovelock's, uh, Lovelock's uh, theory of a life-sustaining life atmosphere in '69. Um, and we have, of course, uh, Watson and Crick and the double helix in 653. And we have the um, somewhere down here. We have the um, the um, uh, the uh, cracking of the genetic code in 61 and the first complete genetic sequence of an organism in 77. And then it all culminates. And then as well, to cap it all, we get these two extraordinary discoveries of near complete skeletons of our species, which is uh, Lucy uh, in dated 4 million BC in 1974 and just uh, uh, 10 years later, the first uh, vers virtually complete skeleton of Homo erectus to in 84. Um, which has a word completes that sense of the evolutionary drama. I mean, this is staggering. And, you know, perhaps we think we know it. The amazing thing is actually that we knew none of these things when I was born. And um, one can realise that, you know, this is a sort of intellectual achievement which can never be repeated. And it makes anything that the humanities have done during this time seem utterly trivial in comparison. <laughs> Philosophy, theology, what have they told us that begins to touch this? What have they done? How have they changed the world in the way that science has changed the world? And so, this is, interestingly, there isn't really, this is quite an interesting slide, because there isn't really a properly, you know, chronological account of, which brings it all together, you know. This is relatively recent past, and only now can we ho all hold it in our mind's eye. 
So, that is science triumphant, almost. Um, the trouble is that um, <coughs> the very success of science poses its own problems, scarcely acknowledged to itself. And the first is that its very triumph dramatically reduces or limits the possibilities for further simultaneously, similarly monumental discoveries. The fact remains is that by the time you could say, this is how it happened, this is how the universe came into existence, this is how big it is, this is how the solar systems were formed, this is you know, how our Earth came into being, this is you know, the code of life. But actually, what comes after that is going to be a bit of an anticlimax. Big problem. The second thing is that it has become quite clear that this remorseless scientific advance in understanding and explaining the material world of <clears throat> does not appear to extend into the biological world. For the simple reason that biology, in the form of, for example, a fly, is billions upon billions upon billions of times more complex than the physics and chemistry of the universe. And this has become particularly clear in the very recent past, the last 20 years or so, with the problems encountered by the two great bastions of biological science, which is genetics and neuroscience. <coughs> and I apologise if I have touched on this, uh, this um, before at uh, the Thomas More Institute, but just to repeat that again, very, very briefly, the point is that by the time <coughs> that the extraordinary ability to, step to, for example, spell out the full sequence of genes strung, along, strung out along the double helix of worm, man, mouse, fly, whatever, uh, has produced findings which defy all ready comprehension. That is to say, it appears that the same modest 20,000 genes can be found across the vast range of organismic, organismic complexity that separates a millimetre long worm from ourselves, and that there's absolutely nothing in that genome which tells us why a fly has got two legs, uh, two wings and six legs, or four legs, and a dot-sized brain, and why we should stand upright and walk across the van with our massively sized brain. And this, dare I say it, poses certain problems for prevailing evolutionary theory. And the same applies to the neurosciences, which similarly produces uh, generated findings of utter um, uh, indiscutability. And as I have alluded to before, it is quite clear that now that there is nothing, there is no way in which one can, as it were, get from the monotonous <laughs> electrochemistry of the brain to the richness of the human mind. <clears throat> so, there we have this creates an interesting problem where science has, is currently is in a, has a bit of a problem on its hands. This should, of course, be the best of times. Its institutions have never been greater. Its funding has never been more lavish. Not surprisingly, in view of that extraordinary achievement of the last 50 years. And yet it finds itself caught between this rock and this hard place. The rock of the extraordinary achievements which cannot be replicated. You could never again discover the Big Bang, on the one hand. And the deep, deep inscrutability of biology, um, which defies the simplistic explanations of uh, uh, current biology. In this context, <coughs> it's quite interesting to see, to examine, 
the nature or the coverage of science coverage in the newspapers. How do they respond to this? And um, what actually is it about? Well, the first and most striking observation is how very little real science there is. <laughs> Um, certainly compared to early epochs. Not surprisingly, we don't have nothing to, no equivalent to the first heart transplant or the first polio vaccine or the first test tube baby to report. In fact, what one does find is this curious m amalgam of the trivial and the sensational. And I just want to illustrate this um, very briefly with a uh, light-heartedly <laughs> with a couple of slides, which is a summary of, in the Journal called The Week, of the major medical stories of last year. <coughs> uh, and it comes under two. It says, the first was, some of the things they said were good for us. And <coughs> we have to remember, these are science stories in the sense that they are, you know, they are generated from within the academ academia, you know, these are published in peer-reviewed journals and so on. So that one of the, some of the things, they t this is 2004, but I mean it could easily be 2003 or 2005, doesn't really matter. So we learn some of the things are good for us, weddings are good for you, because uh, um, uh, great, great news for women because it makes them happier and live longer. Uh, so Second World War rations weren't popular with children at the time. Uh, egg cod liver oil really does ease aching joints. Um, uh, blueberries identified as a superfood. Uh, uh, drinking tea can sharpen the memory. This is no joke. Anybody who reads the Telegraph will <laughs> find all these stories very familiar. Uh, and then, then here we have some things which we're able to avoid. Um, uh, cannabis, bad for you, of course. Aspirin, formerly wonder drug, now discovered to cause cancer. Uh, Breakfast cereals, uh, there was a much unhealthy levels of salt and sugar. Sleep is all very well, but only in moderation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, traffic jams don't just drive commuters potty, they may also trigger heart attacks. <clears throat> this is what passes for science. <clears throat> now, there is, of course, a lot of second category of you know, science coverage. There is, of course, a lot of the, you know, discovering the gene for this and the gene for that. And, you know, yet another neuroscientific <coughs> study which pinpoints some attribute of the brain to some neurons in the lower hippocampus. But the actual question of what it all adds up to, oh, what you alluded to, how it could be that we should share the same number of genes as a millimetre long worm, or, you know, how you get from, you know, the brain to the mind, these things are, uh, are not encountered, they're not touched on, you know, just ignored. Um, next, we find that even the major scientific projects of the recent years have turned out to be slightly disappointing. Um, you will recall, <laughs> some of you, the furore over the first, uh, or over Dolly, you know, the first cloned sheep. Oops, that's sorry, this is just to go back to the New England Journal of Panic-Inducing Gobbledygook, which is <laughs> random medical news. And here we have, according to a report released today, smoking, exercise, fatty food, stress can cause hypothermia, glaucoma, depression in children to incompile <laughs> 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 Science, you know? <laughs> Amazing thing, really. OK, so we're back to... Uh, <laughs> so we're back to... Um, Yes, the astonishing achievement of cloning the first sheep. And I always wondered, you know, so what was the point of cloning a sheep? <laughs> they all look the same to me. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, this was going to transform the whole of biology. It was, according to science in 1997, the most important scientific achievement of the, of the year. And where is Dolly now? Well, she is stuffed <laughs> in a museum in Scotland, and it must be said, we are none the wiser <laughs> for her. Um, 
So at the risk of gross overgeneralization, I would like to suggest that the vast majority of these science stories tend to fall into one of two categories, the, the utopian and the apocalyptic, in both of which science, scientists, the experts, are presented as being possessed of some higher form of knowledge than the rest of us, more searching, more truth-seeking, and are committed to uh, making the world a better place. And into the utopian category comes all those, you know, endless prom promises that the cure for cancer is just around the corner and that stem cell therapy is going to allow the blind to see and the lame to walk, <coughs> even though, you know, they still haven't done the experiments on rats. And the apocalyptic range from swine flu and our friend at the airport uh, to global warming, where as it were, science identifies these you know, terrible threats to humanity and then places itself in a position to, uh, <coughs> uh, um, prom to promise to solve it. So this is a only slightly caricatured, but a not <coughs> over-caricatured portrayal of what passes for a lot of science in our newspapers. Um, and I want to understand, try to explain, just very briefly, in five minutes, what might be going on here. <clears throat> Newspapers, of course, have to keep things simple because they are writing for a non-sophisticated, scientifically sophisticated public. <clears throat> Uh, but beyond that, it's become quite clear in the recent past, and uh, it's described in an excellent book by a Guardian journalist called Nick, Nick Davis called Flat Earth News, that um, major powerful influences in society, in inverted commas, have taken to using newspapers as the conduit of their particular view of how things are, and in order to present themselves, as it were, in the best, best possible light. And within that context, we have to think of our science reporter earlier on in the press conference. Not, of course, that people go to press conference in anymore. And there she is, and she's working against a deadline, and she's got three or four stories to file. And, um, uh, and you know, the, the only way to do that is to rewrite the press release and to... Um, you know, rewrite the editorial in the Nature of Science or highlight some aspect or other. Um, and the opportunity really to engage and to be thoughtful and to ask what's really going on here doesn't really arise. Um, <clears throat> and my view would be that the science establishment is, in one sense or another, only too well aware of this very, very difficult situation it is, it is now in. There it is. Massive research institutes have to keep the funds going, have to keep the funds flowing. And yet, that sense of, you know, its golden age of ebbing away, and um, uh, on the one hand, and the inscrutability of this big, these big projects, which promise so much. And, and so to that extent, you know, what we're seeing here the way is, is that this is this portrayal of science in the news, only vaguely caricatured, is, um, is a way in which the, um, uh, uh, the science establishment, as it were, tries to uh, maintain its profile as high as possible in you know, these rather difficult circumstances. And in, those, in, those, in that situation, it seems to me, it has to, uh, by necessity, assert the priority of scientific materialism and deny the possibility that actually these issues, as epitomised by 
the questions raised by the findings of science in the last 50 years, whether it's the question of the Big Bang or the complexity of life or whatever it might be, to assert the priority of science of the materialist view over the suggestion that there might conceivably be any metaphysical interpretation of them. Uh, and so I'll finish there. Um, there are, there's more that can be said, and perhaps that will emerge. But one of the interesting things that you know, I have noticed, for example, in the last 10 or 15 years, is this recurring phony war between science and religion whenever some issue, such as uh, you know, the experiments on hu human embryos or cloning or stem cell series, uh, or, um, uh, uh, research arises. And there's always the real characteristic of all these phony wars is the scientific establishment, deliberately, it seems to me, and intentionally, massively overestimating or making quite inordinate claims, given the present state of knowledge, about how absolutely crucial it is that we, as it were, <coughs> go forward with these um, uh, research programmes, um, and um, which, of course... Naturally, naturally, as it were, um, evokes a certain response from the religious community who, for, for reasons that we know, and this then allows them to you know, present themselves in this, in this you know, incredibly self-serving way as being you know, science, progress, you know, betterment of mankind, aren't we all clever that we can do these sort of things, versus religious obscurantism, don't really care, that's all right. But anyway. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, James. And um, I'll open the floor for questions and then I'll ask one myself. So, Carl. Uh, 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 the very interesting. I, I enjoy the talk a lot. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering, though, uh, when, when you talk about how, how little we really understand about our genes and uh, and so on there, whether, whether that observation in a sense almost contradicts what you said earlier, that the, the science of understanding ourselves is in its infancy, it's very immature science, and, and we're just getting these little small hints now that there's things in our genes that might be helpful in understanding ourselves. I mean, Francis Collins has just finished like a week ago a book on personalized medicine where he's going to make this a part of his uh, agenda to, to change the way medicine is practiced. Uh, there. So it, it seems to me that, that this is sort of like Copernicus who gets a new idea about where the planets are and then you begin a few centuries of sorting that all, sorting that all out and it seems to me we're going to have lots of exciting things and, and they'll be maybe way more interesting than vaccines for polio and putting... Well of course this is, yeah, this is Karl Popper's famous promise to materialism. When are we going to sort this out? 30, 40, 100 years, 400 years. This idea that somehow or other, you know, science is, you know, just at the beginning of its upward curve of knowledge of solving these problems. The problem about this, the two problems about this. Now, firstly, <laughs> despite what Francis Collins might say, is that the findings that we know of science, of doing these genome projects, defy any credible conception of the nature of genetic inheritance. We have just, it's not that, you know, we're at the beginning of finding out. We thought, until recently, that we understood the principles of genetic inheritance. How then can one begin to, as it were, accommodate these findings? I mean, those are only, the ones I've just alluded to are only the most dramatic. And you know, the fact is that the, uh, you know, the same regulatory genes, we share the same regulatory genes as the flies. How does that fit into the evolutionary story? And this, of course, is a very interesting point, because, of course, the whole basis of the oracles of science and the scientific materialism is the assumption that we already know the answer. This evolution is a fact. Evolution is certainly a fact. There's nothing more self-evident than the fact that things evolved. But their claim, of course, is that they know how it happened. And that's why, you know, that's the problem. Are these things, and has always been, you know, the fundamental impetus to the metaphysical view that actually there is more than we can know, and that the beauty and the wonder of the natural world intimates things which lie beyond the powers of human understanding. 
And that certainly applies to the findings of the Genome Project, irrespective of what Francis Collins might say. So, I mean, that is briefly the answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, um, why are you so pessimistic about the prospects of science, the way you just expressed it? And I'll give you an example of how you can take this particular fact that you were discussing in a different way. Imagine you have two organisms that have the same number of genes. If that was true, uh, say, a chimp and a human, um, and they share 99% of their genes, we all know that they're very different in other ways. This, re this, this, this generates a very interesting question as to how to explain the differences. And it shifts the attention of scientists away from the genome project to perhaps the regulation of <coughs> complex processes that give rise to differences. And this could be a project of several other centuries to work. It could. So I'm okay, sure it will keep giving them. you another perspective. Maybe it's too optimistic, but I wonder why you are pessimistic about the prospects well, of I mean, these kinds of Well, I mean, as of this moment, it is reasonable to be incredibly pessimistic. Because the point is that it's not that you know this is a problem. The problem is that they don't have any idea of what's going on. I mean, the point about, you see, what's for its worth, you know. Well, two points. I mean, can I just go back? I mean, the f firstly, my point stands that we can't rediscover the history of the universe. So from that point of view, you know, that is sort of spoken for. And therefore, the whole focus of science has now shifted towards the biological sciences, and particularly these two great projects, neuroscience and genetics. Um, and... Um, Oh, on which, in a sense, the you know the hopes the hopes rest. But my, I think, the most economical way of putting this is just to make, to make that previous point that if you try to imagine the difference between a fly on the surface of a pond and a pebble at the bottom, and let's say they are the same size and they're composed of the same number of Then your pebble on the bottom on the bottom of the pond is, you know, obviously a, uh, <coughs> an array of atoms, all well organised and so on. You begin to think about that fly. You know, I mean, what it does, what its attributes are, you know, how it sustains itself, and that's my point about it being billions upon billions upon billions of times, and the notion that somehow or other, you know, just because you can, you know that some or other, just because you can, as it were, uncurl the double helix that you're going to find in that monotonous sequence of genes, you know, a deep explanation of that. I mean, let's be humble about this. That would be my boy. You know, are we going to give them 400 years? Or are we going to say, you know, challenge, that's reasonably challenge better physically, you know, the claim that, um, that uh, you know, that there ain't no what's going on. I mean, as it is, um, Essentially, the current scientific project is to do yet more genome projects and yet more protein, yet more of these sort of big science projects in the hope, perhaps, that under the avalanche of undigested and indigestible facts, you know, these really important philosophical questions that have emerged will somehow get buried. Um, I mean, it's a very interesting thing, the point, about, you know, the point about the double helix, is that we thought we could crack it because it was simple. There it is, double helix. All you have to do is to check out all the, you know, work out what all those genes are up to, and there you've got your organism. But the point about double helix is not that it is simple. It seems simple and elegant. It's not simple because it is simple, obviously. It's simple because it has to be simple if it is going to replicate the genetic, genetic information every time the uh, cell divides. And that requirement to be simple means that it has to condense within itself, you know, the deep, deep complexities of biology. And, you know, when we're on the running. I, I see your point. I, I, what, what scientists are doing is that all the time is they're redescribing reality so that it's simple enough so that they can deal with it, not <laughs> be otherwise. And I also agree that one has to be very humble about these things. Yeah, there's this absolutely fascinating thing that we agree on, this mystery that needs to be explained, and you haven't really told me why you prefer 
to stay away from it. Whereas I, I know, I'm very, very keen to engage with it. Oh. My point is that they are not keen to engage with it. You know, you could read, you know, science journals from one year's end to the next, and you wouldn't get a sense that there's anything extraordinary going on here. So they published the genome of the sea urchin, which turns out to have exactly the same number of genes as ourselves. <coughs> Even though, you know, it leaves an unoffensive life other than causing <laughs> grief to unwary students. <laughs> you would have thought that was an interesting observation. Oh, absolutely fascinating that we should have the same number of genes as a sea urchin. Published in Nature, New Science, without comment. <laughs> <laughs> your, your point about the genome, uh, I think, is absolutely spot on when you say that that uh, number of genes issue between us and the, and the worm or fly uh, is a major problem. But, but I think you're being quite unfair to say that science has left it at that and is still just churning out more sequences. In fact, it turns out that if you look, I think, maybe beyond the popular versions of this and into the science that's going on itself in biology, you'll find that that discovery brought molecular biology up short into a wall and that it's, it's driving currently a profound metaphysical shift within the discipline with, with which most people who are currently practicing it are not really aware. Uh, a book like uh, Evolution and Emergence, which came out under the editorship of Nancy Murphy and Bill Steger, addressed that very question. What are these complexities doing to the underlying metaphysical assumptions of the discipline of biology? I'm going to make the case that biology is going through a profound revolution exactly because of the point you made. It's not ignoring it. Uh, and people like Lee Hood are now writing papers in which the metaphysical basis of the paper is 180 degrees different from what it would have been 10 years ago. No, I take your point. I mean, I'm sure Nancy Murphy is raising these questions. But she, of course, is a professor of theology. Is she not? Sure. Bill Stager's a cosmologist. Yeah. But, you know, you won't find oh, Richard Dickey Dawkins jumping up and down <laughs> telling her about that. No. I'm not talking about somebody who's locked in the paradise. No, no, no. <laughs> but I mean, that's the point, Dickie Dawkins, or any of them. You know, the popular, you know, the, what I'm saying is, you know, the scientific view. I mean, you know, I, mean, I agree. I'm all in favor of rethinking these things metaphysically. But my goodness, they are very profound metaphysics. And the trouble with scientists, they're not very good at metaphysics. <laughs> uh, Steve. Maybe, James, you can clarify what, what the thesis is. If I give you two options. One. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can opt for a third as well. But, before you, but I'll also provide some background why I'm posing it this way. Um, is, the, is the claim that, um, that you're sort of betting that science isn't going to be able to fathom these complexities? Or is there some sense in which you're putting a priori limits on science's ability to do it? In the sense that, you know, in principle, right, given the nature of scientific materialism, it will never be able to touch this. And I raise this, uh, this latter possibility because uh, the last time scientific materialism was a really big worldview issue at the end of the 19th century, right, there were people like Dubois, Raymond, and Heckel who were actually talking about, right, these ultimate world riddles that science will never be able to get at, right, because science is understood within this materialist framework and stuff like the nature of life and the nature of mind in its ultimate sense beyond just the material substrate takes us into a totally different realm. And they were saying this about the origin of the universe and stuff like that. And so they were, you know, so there was this kind of catchphrase around, you know, we will never know. And these, and the materialists were saying this because they were trying to draw a line <coughs> between science and something else. Now, the interesting thing about this, of course, is with the revolutions in physics and everything else in the 20th century, these guys got blown out of the water because they were seen as having too, being too limited in their imagination and underestimating science's ability to redefine the problems. So what they, were, they as materialists were taking as inherent limitations to science, sounding a bit like you, actually, but, but being materialists and recognizing that science can't go beyond certain points, all of a sudden all these issues got redefined in the 20th century through scientific revolutions. Right? So in other words, science made, as it were, a qualitative shift. And some of the comments that have been said in response to your talk kind of suggest that maybe science itself can lift itself out of this kind of metaphysical impasse that you seem to have it placed in. No, well, I mean, I think, you know, I think there are two, two points. I mean, I, this notion that you know, science has come to its end, has come to its limits, you know, is 
recurring thesis, isn't it? Right, right. You know, it's always wrong. I mean, Lord Kelvin, you know, said, you know, in, in uh, whatever it was, 1890, that you know the future of physics lay in the sixth point of decimals. You know, mm -hmm. futile, or further you find the knowledge, and so on and so on. I think the interesting point about these materials was, of course, ultimately they were right. I mean, the science, of course, actually has brought to our attention very, very forcibly that question about, you know, how do you explain the origin of the US, for example, or the origin of life. Um, and, uh, and in a sense, these questions have been put, I think, on the back burner for, you know, 50 years, <coughs> partly because science has been so successful. You don't worry about these questions if you're working out the theory of the Big Bang and so on and so on. But once it's happened, and you have to think back and think, no, oh, well, that is really interesting. You know, what does that all add up to? I think that's point one. So in a sense, although these characters define these people that you referred to, um, although in a sense their reasons why these things were ultimately inexplicable was wrong at the time. In fact, they've been subsequently vindicated in a way at least. Um, so you do take kind of their position, only an updated version? No, I think my other, I think the other, yes, sort of, yes, okay. no, I, no, I do, I do. Okay. I think my other point, sorry, just to get back to that, is the thing about those guys at the 19th century, and indeed about biology till the, you know, late 30s, early 40s, is that people who were involved in biology had a feel for its sense, had a feel for its complexity. You know, there's ap you know, there's a doctor, you know, there is absolutely nothing simple about ourselves, about our biology. I mean, as one, as one knows, you know, practicing medicine, you know, earwax, fingernails, you know, all these things are deeply, deeply, and you kind of feel for that. One of the problems of, you know, biology or molecular biology, of course, in the last 50, 60 years, is it's been so dominated by the genetic paradigm, which is amenable to experimentation in a grossly simplified form, uh, and its various paradigms. This is, of course, that biologists have lost their sense of this deep complexity, um, essentially. And so you go to departments of zoology or physiology or botany in a Cambridge University, and there aren't any zoologists, and there are no botanists, and there are no physiologists. They're all doing genetics, you know. And, and, so, and so I think one of the things that you know, why this is so interesting is that this problem that has emerged from these genome things are not only, you know, sort of intractable in, in themselves, but as it were, they, re, you know, they raise again that spectre of, you know, how does one explain the phenomenon of life? You know, how does one uh, get from the, um, you know, the same monotonous sequence of chemicals to the near infinite diversity of the living world? And science doesn't know. And I think that's really interesting. That's why things have changed. You see, that's why I disagree with you, Carl. You know, and that's why, although I don't sympathise with the, you know, the ID brigade, I don't agree with them. But, um, uh, um, you know, we're on a very interesting, I think we're on a very interesting cusp, but there we are. <laughs> so we've got two minutes left, uh, so I'm going to ask for a short question and a short answer. Um, we're using the terms science and nature, I think, um, a shorthand for science as defined um, in materialist terms, nature as defined in materialist terms. There's no reason, that, so we say, science might be able to lift itself out of this. Well, what do we mean by science? And it seems to me that the real issues are... Are, are, are metaphysical. Um, it's not that we dispute that there's a great deal of new um, information. The question is how is that best going to be integrated into an overall explanatory scheme? And of course, since sort of Descartes and the scientific revolution, it, the, the, the parameters or the, the basic metaphysical parameters have been this is essentially materialist. Our mm. definition of nature is essentially materialist. Yeah. We, we cut out um, final causes and... Um, what's the other one? Um, formal, formal, formal. 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 <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, <clears throat> are, you, are you suggesting, this is something I'd be very sympathetic towards, that, that actually if we were to re-embrace final and, and formal causes, we would go back and to sort of open up the metaphysical definitions of what science is, not except this. In fact, much of the um, 
information which we have, the explaining the information which we have, would it be, at least become somewhat more comprehensible? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I don't think these things, personally. I mean, this is the sort of you know the, the scientific, the, the, you know, the theistic, the sci scientific argument for theism in its broader sense that actually, given what we know now, and given confronted by these fundamental questions and so on, these are all in the, in their own way, very powerful scientific arguments for a higher intelligence, uh, and there's certainly you know there's certainly no, no contending. Uh, Argument. I, I mean, I think it takes, does take us a bit further than that, though. And I think this is this is where, in a sense, you know, sort of Christian apologetics in this world has got itself in a rather difficult situation. Because I think that some or other one is ultimately impelled to acknowledge the uh, Jewish, the dualist nature of reality. You know, there has to be. You know, there is more to the world than the materialists will tell us. And. Um, uh, of course. But even the definition of dualism is very modern this notion of dualism, a Cartesian notion of dualism. There may be there may be a type of dualism um, which is an Aristotelian type of dualism, which is not sub substance dualism, but it, was, it has different aspects to the one underlying substance, which is a much richer notion of dualism. So that's perhaps that's something to do with ontology, is it? Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>